We know a packet filtering firewall simply looks at the, the packet headers as they come into the firewall and makes a decision whether to accept or drop that packet. And we're mainly looking at things like IP addresses, source and destination, port numbers, uh, protocol numbers. Other things we may look at is the interface. So the firewall may have an I multiple in interfaces. So we can look at from what direction does it come. And we make a decision, accept or not, according to the, the rules that are implemented in the firewall. But we got to a point where the firewall with, a, with simple packet filtering is quite, uh, it performs very well. It's very simple. We just write some rules. And from an implementation perspective, routers are normally designed to look at that information already anyway. A router, what, what a router does is looks at the destination address of a packet to determine where to send it. So a firewall does that as well. It looks at the destination address as well as other addresses to determine what to do with it. So a router and a firewall are a good match because routers are, are designed for doing this packet classification. And it turns out that packet filtering firewalls are, can be implemented very fast. That is, for every packet that comes in, it doesn't take long to process and make a decision. And that's very important if we have a firewall, let's say, for an organization that is handling millions of packets per second coming through it. We don't want to slow those packets down. So packet filtering firewalls are very fast. The users, and when, when the packet is accepted, the user is, has no idea that it's passing through the firewall. Of course, if the packet is blocked, they'll know. But if it's accepted, it's transparent to the users. We'll see some of the other alternatives which may not be transparent to users. The problems, and we started to see them, that we need to create rules to cover both directions. And it starts to get complex to, to handle some special cases with protocols to to block the acknowledgments or to allow the acknowledgments and so on. So it becomes complex to handle policies that require uh, uh, complex rules. Packet filtering firewalls generally don't look at the content of the packets, the data. Okay, so they don't make a decision based upon the data, just the header fields. And one reason for doing that is that it keeps it very simple and very fast but it means you can't block things based upon the data. If someone can take advantage some, of some bugs in the, the, the protocols that the packet filtering is, is uh, looking at, then they may be able to compromise the firewall. As with all firewalls, if you set up the firewall rules wrong, then it may lead to security breaches. And it's, it's a a big issue of designing a firewall, you want to make it as easy as possible for the administrator to set the rules to implement the policy. The more complex the rules, the more likely a mistake. And the more mistakes, the more likely a security breach. So making things simple is an important thing for firewalls. And that led to a stateful packet inspection. That is not just use the packet filtering firewall, but when a rule accepts a packet, maintain a second table that keeps track of what's been accepted and all subsequent packets related to that connection are also accepted. So we went through stateful packet inspection uh, usually with an example. So it's really an extension of normal packet filtering firewalls. So it's not a replacement, it extends normal packet filtering. And we'll see some more examples of that in a moment. One of the issues with stateful packet inspection is that, again, for every connection that is accepted by the firewall, there's an extra entry in the SPI table. And again, when you have millions of entries need to be maintained in a, in a, uh, a network that has many connections, then it introduces some extra overhead for storage and maintaining that state information. But most firewalls today will make use of stateful packet inspection. So let's have a look at some examples. And you've seen them in the quiz, those that have attempted. I'll give you two examples. These are 
so grab one of these. It's just based upon the, well, it's uh, two of the quiz questions. They're very similar. Just take one. Uh, there's question one on the front, question two on the back. So just make sure you're on the right one. So we have a network, our, our simple internet, which identifies four specific subnets and a general internet. That is, assume there are many subnets, but in the picture, for simplicity, I only show those four. And on each subnet, there are many hosts. But again, for simplicity, I only draw two per subnet. And we'll re refer to those specific ones in the, in the tables. And we're, in these two questions, we're given a packet and we need to make a decision, accept or not. And we want to look at the tables and determine what accepts it and what doesn't. Some other questions you would have seen is you need to write the rules to achieve some aim, let's say block someone accessing the web server on computer 5, write the rule or fill in the, the, ta the rule entries. These questions are the other ones where you just determine whether it's accepted or not. So in this case, there are two routers shown, A and B. And we are given the firewall rules as well as the stateful packet inspection table. And we're also given a packet and we need to determine. So question one, let's have a look at it. What are we given? We're given the firewall table. So this specifies a set of rules, five rules in this case. So the, these already exist, indicating the source address, destination, transport protocol, and the action to take if a packet matches those conditions. And the default policy is drop in this case. So if a packet doesn't match those conditions, we'll need to drop that packet. And we're also given the stateful packet inspection table, SPI table. And so you have that on your printout and the, the packet as well. So two tables stored in the firewall. So this assumes the administrator has set up those first five rules. Some packets have flowed through the firewall. And as a result, these eight entries in the SPI table have been automatically added. So, so note that the, the staple packet inspection table is maintained by the, the firewall, not by the administrator, not by the human user. And now we receive a new packet at the firewall. And it's drawn here. We're just given the, the header types. It's an IP packet. Inside that is a TCP data packet with some data. And the address fields, the source IP address, destination IP address, 11123335, so the two computers in our network, and the port numbers coming from port 23 going to port 44981. What does the firewall do when it gets this packet? It checks the packet addresses against the SPI table. And we're going row by row. The SPI table, because what we first do is we check, does this packet belong to any previously accepted connections? When I say a connection, I mean, especially with TCP, we set up a connection, this SYN, SYNAC, AC, the three-way handshake to set up a TCP connection. And then we have exchange of packets that belong to that connection. So the SPI table keeps track of the connections which have been set up in the past. And we should accept all packets which belong to any previously accepted connections. So what we do is we check row by row. Does it match any of those rows in the SPI table? Yeah. 
Yes, no. Any other choices? Does it match row one? So we just simply need to check, okay, a simple, a quick check for us. The ad addresses must contain 1112 and 3335. So row one obviously doesn't. Row, because it's 2224 and 3336. It doesn't match that. This one doesn't match. We need the exact IP addresses. No, we don't have 2224. What about this one, row 4? Do the addresses, do the IP addresses match? The IP addresses match. Do the port numbers match? Why don't they? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Okay, this one, obviously, why don't they? Because it's a different number. Okay, so first, rule four, or entry four. Note that even though this packet has a source address of 1112 and a destination address of 3335, what we store in the SPI table, when I say source and destination, any packet which has that combination of source and destination, or the reverse, will be accepted. So, this one matches in terms of IP addresses, because the, for simplicity in the SPI table, we just keep track of the first packet in the connection. Let's say the connection was from 3335 to 1112. So we should also allow response packets. We don't explicitly state that in the SPI table. So anything that comes from 1112 and is going to 3335 should also be accepted, ignoring the port numbers so far. So when you check the source and destination address of the packet, versus the entry in the SPI table, check them in both orderings. Not just the one uh, that, that's noted there. That is... Here we have source 1112, destination 3335, so these entries are okay. That is, that packet matches these two conditions because any packet that's from 3335 to 1112 or from 1112 to 3335 match the IP addresses. But of course I think everyone's already noticed that the port number here is wrong. Okay, in this case 4723 does not match our port number. The destination port is okay, but the source port's not. And we need all four conditions to match for the, the rule to match. So again, entry four doesn't match. What about five? Right, check five. Three 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 five source IP source port four four nine eight one. So the entry says anything coming from three 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 five four four nine eight one going to this combination should be accepted, and anything in the reverse also should be accepted. Anything from one 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 two port twenty three going to 3335-44981 should be accepted. And is that what we have in the packet? Yes, in this case. So this packet would be accepted by the fifth row in the SPI table. Three 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 five. 
44981, so th this same application, and uh, these would match. So the packet would be accepted in this case. If we find a match in the SPI table, then that's automatic accept. We don't check the subsequent rules. When we've got a, an accept, we take that action and the packet goes through. So just be careful to consider the combination of addresses in both orders for the SPI table. That's not the case for the firewall rules, just for the SPI table. Try question two then. Given that, on the other side of the page is uh, a slight, slight uh, variant of that. Again, given some rules, given the SPI table and a packet, check what happens. So packet arrives at the firewall, check on the stateful packet inspection table first. We need a combination of IP addresses of 2223 and 4447. So quickly we can rule out this entry. No, no. This one, the port number here is wrong. This one, still the port number is wrong. We're looking for 44981. No. Yes or no? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. No. The, this packet is coming from 4447 port 44981. This rule 6 says coming from 2223 port 4981. So a bit of a trick there. The, the source IP and port must stay together. Okay. So no, 6 doesn't match. If it was from four, if the ports were swapped here, it would be a match, but in this case it's not. Similar, this one will not match, nor will the last one. So none of the entries in the SPI table match. What do we do? Now we go back to our original firewall rules. So we go row by row, checking, and now we do it in the order. So the source IP must be 4447, or some condition that 4447 matches. Rule one, which rule matches, if any? Rule one does not, rule two does not, rule three, Four do not match because they say from network two, we're source address network 4447 or computer 4447. Rule five, someone on network 444, yes we are, 4447 is on that subnet. From any source port, yes, we've got any source port. Going to 2223, yes, we're going to there. Going to the web server on 2223, yes. TCP is the protocol, so yes, so our five conditions match, therefore we take the action, accept.
all our conditions match, so we take the action of accepting this packet. And then what happens? And then? And then? We accept according to Rule 5, and then? We add a new row to the SPI table, the firewall would, because again, we've accepted a new connection in this case. So we'd get another entry in the SPI table saying source 4447, destination IP 2223, and the port numbers would be there such that the, the response packet that comes will be automatically accepted by the SPI table. That's not in the question, in, in the quiz, but that's what would happen. The, the direction of the addresses in the packet must be exact matches in the firewall rules. So we specify the direction in the firewall rules, but in the SPI table we allow any direction. In your quiz, you've got some questions like this one. There's another type of question where you fill in the, the firewall rules. So you're given the policy. The policy is like stop someone from accessing the web server on this computer or allow everyone to access the QSL server. Given that policy, you need to write the rule. So you only need to fill in the entries. Any questions on packet filtering firewalls and stateful packet inspection? No. So you should be able to get 8 out of 8 for the quiz. Okay. Given that, I know there is some bugs in the quiz, so I'll go and manually check them this evening. So let's look at some, al very quickly, some alternative uh, types of firewalls and then we'll look at the locations and we'll finish today with uh, one or two final examples. <laughs> what do these pictures represent here? We can think from a protocol stack perspective a packet comes in, so this is the firewall, and usually in the examples we're considering the firewall is on a router, so we have uh, interfaces to two different directions. We think a packet comes in, and we're mainly inspecting the packet at the transport level, and in, including the IP header. So that's what we inspect, the, the headers of the IP packet and the, the transport layer packet. Nothing is modified by the firewall. Okay, so a packet, if it's accepted, passes through as is. And that's why we say it's transparent to the users because the, the fields in the header and the data, nothing is modified. It's similar for stateful packet inspection, but in addition, the, the firewall, we think, has some database, the SPI table, that stores some state information about what's been previously accepted. What else have we missed? Just going back and forth. Okay, examples of firewalls. Firewalls can be implemented usually in software, or you may get a dedicated hardware device. For example, you can install software on your computer, which acts as a firewall. Or you can go out and buy a device which has a, the dedicated role is to act as a firewall. So maybe the hardware of the device is, is tailored to be fast for uh, firewall purposes. And this just lists some of the names of some software firewalls. 
If we have time today, I'll show you an example of using IP tables in Linux. This is a common firewall software. You've already used it for, not for a firewall, you've used IP tables to change an IP address to a fake IP address in your uh, NTP denial of service attack. We'll also use it for a firewall, which is its main purpose. And other operating systems have other firewalls, usually built in, like come with the operating system, or you can get standalone software outside of the operating system. And there are uh, what we call firewall appliances, basically a, a box that you buy that comes with the hardware and software to operate as a firewall. And here's the names of some of them. Let's look at two other ap approaches. And they're both proxies or gateways. So an application proxy and a circuit level proxy. Sometimes called an application level gateway and a circuit level gateway. So they have some similarities about them. Both of them, they act as, well, they act as a proxy. What's a proxy in terms of networking? A proxy is a device that will accept a connection from one endpoint and create a new connection to the uh, potential to the intended destination, acting on behalf of the of one endpoint to communicate with the other endpoint. An example that you may have heard of is a web proxy, a proxy for a web server. And an application proxy, when it's used as a firewall, acts as a relay for the application level traffic. So let's before going through the, the general concepts, give an example for a web browser, a web server. So normally when we have our web browser, So that our application is web browsing. We have a web server. And they communicate using what protocol? HTTP. So that's the application level protocol. Send a HTTP request. And send back a reply. So the simple mode of web browsing response. So an application proxy with respect to a web browsing will act as an intermediate device between the browser and server rec receiving the requests from the browser potentially modifying it or uh, checking the content in the request forwarding onto the server and similar for the response coming back. So that's the normal mode. If we introduce a proxy, we have a, a third device. We have our browser still. We have the proxy. And the web server. And the browser sends a request and normally it would be configured that the browser or some entity in the network before the proxy would send that request, even if you're trying to access the web server, say of Facebook, the request would be sent to the proxy. So that can be either configured inside the browser itself or maybe there's a device in the network after the, the, the computer of the browser that intercepts the request and forwards it to the proxy. For example, the HTTP request, the source IP address would be that of the computer of the browser and the destination IP address would be that of the computer of the web server in the normal mode. 
when your web browser you want to visit the website of say Facebook then the source IP address will be that of your computer the destini destination IP address will be that of the web server okay so normally you would send the packet to the web server but when we use a proxy as a firewall somehow we must get that packet to go instead to the proxy server and there are two ways to do that you can actually configure the browser you can find settings in the browser that you can specify a proxy which means when someone types in facebook.com instead of your browser sending that request to the Facebook web server it's redirected to the proxy server so you'd specify a proxy server in the browser uh, I have an example maybe let's bring up the web browser For example, in Firefox, if you, I think if you go to the preferences and under advanced preferences, there's network settings, connect, connection, configure how Firefox connects to the internet, no proxy, so the default, don't use a proxy, and some other settings, for example, auto detect proxy settings from the network, that there are ways that uh, your browser can learn about a proxy from other devices on the network. The system proxy settings are just for the entire operating system. Manual means you specify the address of the proxy. So maybe we'd say here whatever the address if we knew it. <laughs> so what is a proxy? We're getting to that. The proxy will receive the request and as a firewall inspect it make a decision whether to accept it or not and then forward it, if it is accepted, forward on to the real web server. It's this intermediate device which will uh, as the security role is to check the request, check that it's allowed. For example, if you're allowed to send a request to Facebook or if you're allowed to send a request with a particular type of uh, fields and similar when the response comes back the proxy will check the response coming back. It can check both the request and response. So first, in the browser, we can specify to use a proxy. There are different types of proxies. Alternatively, there may be a device in the network, say a switch or a router here, that will redirect your traffic to the proxy. I think SIT uses that in some cases where you you open your web browser, you try to log, visit Facebook and it redirects you, the network redirects you to the local SIT login. So that's, although it's not used as a proxy, it's a similar redirection. It sends you not to the Facebook web server, server but to the SIT login web server. So that can be used here to redirect the request to the proxy. So what happens, your request is sent to the proxy. The HTTP request. The proxy in this case is the firewall. So it can check the request and according to some rules or the setup of the proxy it can decide whether to accept or reject the request. So it may have a list of websites that you're not allowed to access or vice versa, that, that only some that you're allowed to access. The point compared to a packet filtering firewall is that the proxy is dedicated for web browsing and it can check the content of the HTTP request message because it will understand that content. A packet filtering firewall sim simply checks the transport layer header and the IP header. It doesn't check the content of of the, the transport data packet. If it's accepted, the proxy or the firewall accepts it, the proxy sends the request onto the server.
if it was accepted. If it's not, then, it's, then it doesn't get sent. Server receives a request for a web page. Who does the server reply to? Right, the, the server knows who to reply to based upon the source address, and the source address will be that of the proxy. Okay. Of this packet, the source is that of the proxy. So that the server will reply to the proxy. What the proxy will do is keep track of, again, some state information saying when it gets the response, it will send the re response back to the correct browser. So the IP source address will be that of the proxy in this case. So when the server gets it, it sends the response to the proxy. And again, the proxy can check the content of the response and determine whether the response should be allowed through. Can check whether there's viruses inside there or, or whatever it uh, can be set up to, to monitor. And if it is accepted, then the proxy forwards that back to the correct web browser. So the proxy is, acts as a web server in that it receives a request and sends a response to the original browser and it also acts as a client for web browsing, that is it acts as a web browser that sends a request and receives a response. So the proxy typically acts as both entities in the client-server communications. So it's special software that can receive a request, then it will check and then send the request onto the, the real server and similar with the response. The advantage of using a proxy is that it can check the content. So it can check the application specific content. It will understand the structure of HTTP requests and responses and it will have some software to check what's in those. So you'd specify rules specific to web browsing. The disadvantage is that usually each proxy is only per application. So this is a web browsing proxy. It doesn't do anything, say, for secure shell connections or FTP connections or email connections. You'd need a separate proxy if you want to uh, monitor or control those other applications. So a proxy is usually per application. If you want to cover all applications, you either need multiple proxies. They could be running on the same computer, but multiple different pieces of software to do this. And it becomes quite complex to cover every type of application that someone may use. A packet filtering firewall doesn't care about the application. It just looks at the IP header and the transport protocol. It covers all applications. So there are some of the trade-offs. Our packet filtering firewall only will work for every application. Our packet filtering firewall, it doesn't matter whether it's HTTP, secure shell, FTP or anything else. It doesn't check that information. It just checks the transport layer ports and the IP addresses. Our proxy will usually be specific to an application. We will not say too much more about proxies. Uh, they are used in a number of cases. Maybe the one thing that is also a disadvantage or a potential disadvantage is that even if our request is and response is accepted, 
it may not be transparent to the, to the user. That is, the user may notice that something has changed. In particular, note from the service perspective, even though the original requests come from the browser, the server thinks it comes from the proxy. So something has changed by introducing the proxy. And that can have an effect on uh, the operation of those applications in some cases. The proxy needs to be compl complex in the way that it keeps track of this response from the server must go to this particular browser. Say we have a proxy for SIT. There are hundreds if not thousands of web browsers inside SIT ac accessing many web servers. Let's say accessing Facebook and all the responses coming from Facebook all go into our proxy server which then must determine which response is forwarded to which browser. It does that by usually using uh, special port numbers to keep track of where the response should go to. Uh, that adds some complexity to the proxy. And it may slow down the communication so it takes some time for the proxy to process and determine where to send it to. So potential bottleneck of performance in that case. And also if your proxy fails, that is it gets overloaded, then again uh, everything fails. The, the packet filtering mode is generally faster because it just looks at the headers of the packets. And the headers of the packets are always, almost always in the same positions when the device receives them. So you can even create hardware to look at those headers, which is very, very fast. But with a proxy, usually you need to look at a lot of information in every packet to make a decision, and that's usually done in software and is much slower. Which is mainly important when you have uh, thousands of, of parallel connections going through that proxy or firewall. you've probably heard that countries may have a firewall. What's the name of the firewall in China? <laughs> the Great Firewall of China? Okay, there, there, there's the, the idea that in China they have a, uh, basically they have filtering of, of traffic from people inside China going out. So it's not just one device that does it, but when we talk about a firewall, it's a set of devices which do things like we're talking about here that they as a request comes from your browser going to some external website, there's some device that intercepts that and checks should it be allowed or not. And of course to allow millions of requests coming through per second, you need a lot of resources in your proxy to, or in general in your firewall to handle that. It can slow down internet access. What was the other one? That was the application proxy. That's per application. So you, you would, let's say you have your proxy server, you may install special software to act as a web proxy and another special piece of software to access as say a, an FTP proxy for file downloads and others. So it's per application and there's extra overhead for dealing with that. It can be more secure than packet filters because you can check more content. You're not just limited to making decisions on the addresses. You can make decisions based upon the content. A circuit level proxy or a circuit level gateway is very similar to application level but it's usually per transport, transport connection as opposed to application. See if we can draw that. And it's specific to TCP usually. So our proxy was we need a separate one for every type of application. With a circuit level proxy it's not per application, it's just for the TCP connections. I'll just write circuit here.
So this is the actual firewall. Similar concept, we intercept the packets, but we don't intercept HTTP requests. We request, we intercept the packets belonging to a TCP connection. For example, the SYN and SYN app. When the client sends a SYN request to the server, it's intercepted by the circuit firewall. So effectively, they create a TCP connection TCP connection between the client and the circuit level proxy using the SYN which is intercepted. The circuit level proxy forwards that SYN onto the real server if it's accepted and will establish a connection, a separate connection there. the end result is that the client creates a TCP connection to the firewall and the firewall creates a separate TCP connection to the server to transfer the data, it doesn't matter what data, web browsing data, email, secure shell, it's specific to TCP only. And again, similar to the application proxy, the circuit proxy uh, can intercept and make decisions what to allow and what not to but it may not be looking at uh, the content in as much detail as an application level proxy. So it, it's intended to work for uh, multiple applications, but that may be a limit, limiting feature in that it, it may not be able to look at the content of all applications. This one we don't see as common as the others, uh, but it's in used in some special cases. I think the main point to be aware is that a proxy intercepts the messages from the client to the server. And as it intercepts, it can check the content as opposed to our packet filtering firewall which will just check the headers, the source and destinations. But checking the content takes more effort, so it can reduce the performance of the network, uh, but can be potentially more secure because you can make better informed decisions. Let's, to finish, look at a couple of uh, examples of where to put a firewall. Okay. In all these cases, where should the firewall be? <coughs> of course, we could locate firewalls on the host. So every PC, every laptop has firewall software running on it. We could do that. So on the end user computers, on the office computers, on all of our servers inside our organization. But that becomes unmanageable once we have a, a reasonable number of users because it's hard to maintain the firewall installation on every separate computer. So when we have a large number of users, rather than locating a firewall on every end device, maybe just have one file firewall on an intermediate device. Often that intermediate device is a router, or plays a similar role as a router. So that's more common when we have larger, larger networks to have one device. We don't necessarily have firewalls on the end user devices. Where that firewall is located on some network device that is the connection between inside to outside, the internal to external network. It's common to put the internal network and break it into multiple, two zones usually. So our internal network will usually have two types of computers inside. So say for SIT, we have all the users for the, all the computers for the users, like the, the lab uh, computers, the lecture room PCs, the laptops and so on. So these are all the end users' computers. And normally, people from outside should not be able to initiate connections to those computers. 
someone out on the internet should not be able to connect and log into the PC here in the lecture room. There's no need for that. This PC in the lecture room may want to access, say, websites out on the internet, initiate connections out, but connections should not be out, allowed to be initiated in to this PC. That's the typical operation. But also inside our organization, we may have some servers that we do want to make publicly available. We have a web server, an email server, that we want people outside to be able to access. So we have two types of computers. So we separate them into the, so the ones that we want to allow the people outside to access, say the public facing servers, and then the other computers like our lab, office, lecture room computers, which are internal only. We may even have some internal only servers, just for internal users, not for external users. So a common way to use a firewall is to locate those public facing servers in a demilitarized zone, a DMZ. So we separate our internal network into two zones. And here's two different implementations of that. Let's look at the top one first. In this picture, the top picture, this red box is a router that connects the internal network to the rest of the world. Okay, so that, uh, it doesn't show, but there's a connection here going to outside, external. This is all internal. This green block here is the firewall. This is the firewall here. Now it could be on the router, but normally it's a, in this case it's a separate device. The DMZ hosts the public facing web server or public facing servers, including a web server, maybe an email server or other servers that we would like to allow people outside to access. So they are internal computers, but we want to allow others to initiate connections to them. And then we have all of our other computers, like our office computers, lecture room computers, lab computers, which we say are internal. Here it's called the intranet. So our internal network. And we don't want allow, to allow people outside to direct connections to them. So this is the example of the, the DMZ, the zone which is sort of in between internal and external. And the firewall should be set up with rules such that anything coming from outside not going to the DMZ should be blocked, should not be accepted. If anything comes from outside, it gets to the firewall. If the destination is not, any, if not someone in the DMZ, like the website, it should not be allowed in. It should only allow something in if it's going to the uh, web servers, email servers that we allow the public to access. And that makes the firewall very simple to block outside users getting in. And again, we come back to we want to make the firewall as simple as possible to set up so that we don't make mistakes. The firewall should also have rules to, for example, allow the internal users to access out, assuming we want to allow our internal users to access external services. So we'd have rules for that. And let's say here we only have a web server. That's the only server we want then again, the firewall would be configured not just to, uh, based upon IP address, but also port number. Anything coming from outside, not going to port 80, a web server uses port 80, anything that's not going to port 80, drop. So it's very easy to write a rule to do that. You could do that. So and that makes it very simple and very unlikely that you'll make a mistake. An alternative implementation is to use two firewalls. So there are two separate firewalls here. The DMZ again is the public facing servers, our website, say for SIT, the email server for SIT, 
We want to allow people outside to access them, so this first firewall would be set up. Something coming from outside that reaches this firewall, if the destination is the SIT website, allow it in. If it's not one of our public facing servers, block it. What's the advantage of two firewalls here? As opposed to the first one with one. Well, what, it may be easier, what's the disadvantage? We need two different devices or two, di uh, two devices to maintain, it costs more to, to set them up. Uh, so we prefer to have just one firewall. So why, why would we use two firewalls in this case? More secure, okay, how is it more secure? You can get a filter wrong and it still should be blocked by the second one. Okay, so it can be more, f in theory, they, the first one can be just as secure, but this one is uh, probably easier to set up and less likely to make mistakes in that case. So this second firewall close to the intranet here, anything that's coming from outside that is coming in on this interface here should be blocked. Unless it's a response to a connection. So when I say anything coming in, I mean the connections initiated from outside. For example, our TCP SYN packet. Anything that arrives in here that is not related to a connection that was established from an in internal computer should be blocked. Because there's no reason for someone out here to access anyone on the internet. And there's no reason for the website to initiate a connection to someone on the internet. So this one, the firewall can be set up very easily. Anything coming in that's initiated from outside, block it. Block or drop, correct. They mean the same thing. Okay. Anything similar to the, the first firewall, anything coming in that is not destined to our public servers, drop them. And if you make a mistake on the first one, maybe you do allow something in going to port uh, to an IP address which is not here but is someone internal. If you do make a mistake on the first firewall, you add the wrong rule, then the second firewall should still block it. But the second, right, if you misconfigure both of them, then you get fired from your job. But the, the chance of doing that on the second one is very hard because everything that's initiated from outside, drop. Everything. There's no need to accept anything that's initiated from outside. And that could be set as a default policy. So there's no way for something to get past that. Whereas in the first firewall, we need to add some rules to allow people to access our web server, our email server, and maybe we do that based upon IP address. Maybe we enter in the wrong IP address. If we're using the first firewall implementation at the top, if we set a rule thinking we're allowed to access the website, but in fact it allows us to access someone to access someone on the internet, then that can be a potential compromise of security. In the second case, the second firewall would block that. So it's all about reducing the, the impact of errors. The firewall examples we went through had like five rows in the firewall table, eight in the SBI table. I'm sure you'll all get them correct. You will not make a mistake. But real, real firewalls may have hundreds of rules in the firewall table. And that becomes quite hard for the human to manage and make sure they don't make a mistake. This is just another picture of the second case, uh, just with a few more details of, of the network devices. But again, two firewalls, external firewall, internal firewall, and the DMZ. We may have internal servers that only people on the inside can access, so, but our 
web server, email server, DNS server should be accessible to people out on the internet. The external firewall will control that. So it's just the same as the, the previous slide, the second picture. So firewalls control traffic into and out of a network or a computer if we have a firewall on an individual computer. They can control based upon servers or services, what website or what server you're accessing, the direction of traffic, what's coming in or out. You can control based upon users. We haven't seen any examples of that, but you could filter based upon which user is sending the traffic and behavior like application proxies look at the content. We've spent some time on packet filtering firewalls where we write rules to accept or reject packets based upon the headers. And we extended that with stateful packet inspection which keeps track of past connections to make it a little bit easier for the firewall administrator. And today we've mentioned proxy firewalls which act as a, uh, a relay server the client connects to the proxy, the proxy connects to the real server. And that allows the proxy to, to inspect the traffic in more detail. It's all about making it as simple as possible so that we don't have errors when we set up firewalls. Because if we, we make errors, it may allow uh, someone to compromise the network. There are issues that if we set up a firewall, let's say, to block everything but web browsing, we don't allow secure shell, we don't allow email, so we just allow web browsing, then there's still ways for people to use web browsing and HTTP to tunnel, to carry traffic of those other applications. So there are ways to bypass security pol policies which try to block some applications by sending that application data via accepted applications, tunneling. We may see examples of tunnels in a later topic when we look at VPNs, virtual private networks. And of course, firewall, firewalls can be bypassed if people use other devices that connect to a network that doesn't go via our firewall. If you're inside SIT, you can bypass the SIT firewall by using your your 3G connection. And that can be a security uh, concern for the organization. Or you can bring in a laptop uh, or a USB device which contains a virus and the firewall cannot protect the network against that. So you need another, other methods to do that. Deep packet inspection is really about we, we said with packet filtering firewalls, we just look at the headers. More advanced firewalls will look not just at the headers, but the content. And that you, so we ins inspect the packet in detail. It's referred to as deep packet inspection. And it allows very fine-tuned control of what comes in and out. But it may have a significant impact on performance. So there's a lot of work on how to do that efficiently. Any questions on firewalls? We have one more example to go through. 